hours. Oh, wow. Yeah. What? My podcast is about an hour, an hour, 15 minutes. It was a lot less painful than other <laughs> two hour podcasts I have done. Like, I didn't notice it was two hours. Whereas, yeah, he, um, is this your lunch? It's for you. Oh and you're a mother. It's ridiculous. This is so amazing. <laughs> I'm like, I can't believe you've done this. Like, I'm so grateful. Okay, no, well, I'm going to. Can so, I eat? Are we on? Are we filmed? I don't yeah. know. Are I'm going <laughs> to. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to. I'm going to eat your. We can talk about this while we. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, Wolfgang, do I uh, do no, anything? Uh, Son, okay. Yeah. Dude, thanks for the coffee. No problem. Amazing. Okay. Perfekt, ska vi se. Du får lite så solig ansikt. Ja, men det är faktiskt. Ja, ja, det gör ingenting. Du får en väldigt fin. You have a nice glow when the sun is. Yeah, I get a nice glow from the sun. The northern glow. Yeah. <laughs> Dermatology must be very different in Norway, in Arctic Norway. Yeah, we have a lot of skin diseases in the. Do Norway. you have any skin cancer at all? Yeah. Because Norwegians, they uh, they go on holiday. They go on holiday and yeah. they burn themselves for right, of 14 course, days. Of course they do. Of course they do. Yeah. yeah okay. Uh, so so that's question. the problem. <laughs> so we do have it's uh, rising in Norway as well. But uh, Chris, welcome to the podcast. It is a joy to be here. I have to introduce you. Okay. Go for it. Uh, I'll so correct you if you. Uh, if I say anything wrong. Welcome to the podcast Leger om Live or Doctors on Life, as it's called in English. My name is Annette Draglen. I'm a medical doctor, and my intention with this podcast is to make useful, fun, and important knowledge about body, mind, and health easily accessible to us all. Uh, today, I have the pleasure of welcoming Dr. Chris von Tulliken to the podcast. He's a renowned physician broadcaster and author, and uh, Dr. Von Tulken has made a significant contribution to medical science and public health through his research and public outreach. Today we will discuss his latest book, Ultra Processed People, Why Do We All Eat Stuff That Isn't Food and Why Can't We Stop?, which delves into the pressing issue of ultra-processed foods in our diets. Welcome, Chris. It's such a pleasure to be here. <laughs> that was a lovely introduction. Yeah, I wrote it very myself. Very flattering, very flattering. <laughs> Uh, uh, how's your trip to Norway going? Well, it's better since you brought me this um, incredible lunch. If you're like, n I've never done anything where someone is presenting me with, I don't know if this is, we can see this, but there's a, a, a glowing hot uh, <laughs> package of these incredible oat cakes that I'm going to share with my mother-in-law and publicist on the way home. So anyway, I'm going to, can I eat while we talk? Of course, Chris. Uh, because yesterday I was at your talk with Marit. Mm-hmm. You and Marit Kolbi had a talk about ultra processed food, which was very, uh, it was a very good talk, important talk and terrifying talk. Well, it was, it was, I hadn't understood really the, the, the audience would contain sort of the Norwegian podcasting health royalty. So it was anxious <laughs> making everyone be there, but it felt it, it was a good, it was a good vibe in the room. Because the, the room was very small at the library, so I yeah. could, if anyone was on their phone or looking bored, you could see. So it it felt like it was just such a lovely, engaged crowd who who, who wanted to understand detail. Uh, but what I saw yesterday is that um, when you talk, people get so engaged in what you're saying. And it's so easy to understand what you're talking about because you make it... Um, you make it uh, fun to uh, to learn about, but also very interesting. I think people are engaged because what I'm saying is extremely obvious. And I think science is interesting in, on, in two ways. It's either because it overturns your whole understanding of the universe and your own life. So the theory of relativity changes everything we understand about like space and time. Yeah. What I'm saying is the other kind of interest in science where it confirms everything you've ever believed. It's kind of obvious, but now we bring hard data and evidence to to kind of prove, essentially this proves my mother and my my grandmother. I mean, it, it, it's my, my kind of female line who've been saying what I'm saying for, for, for generations. So that that's why I think people get engaged. Hmm. Yeah, I'm very happy that you wrote this book. It's a great book and I highly recommend it. But yesterday, I met your mother-in-law and I asked her, I was so lucky that I got to sit right next to her. <laughs> and I asked her, 
what is this one thing I should ask Chris when I have him on the show tomorrow? And she laughed and she said, ask Chris about the blue bow. <laughs> that woman is a liar and a fraud. <laughs> I'd never met her until last night. Look, I'm very lucky. I live with my mother-in-law. She's a very, she's got a PhD in experimental psychology. She's also an ex-psychoanalyst, oh. ex-Freudian psychoanalyst. Yeah. And she's just an incredible person. You know, she does, she's a much better parent to my daughters than frankly me or her daughter are. Um, so no, she's right. We have a big blue bowl in the kitchen and the blue bowl is full of ultra processed stuff that my kids are given in party bags by, by grandparents, uh, as treats, you know, th this stuff accumulates in your house, no matter what you do, it, it you know, it, it has to be there. And so, uh, the kids get treats from the blue bowl. So oh, my house so is not, my house is not an ultra processed food free zone. And my children are not banned from ultra processed food. But they get to see the blue bowl and they get to. It's eat interesting from it the sometimes. blue bowl is visible in the kitchen. Like when you, it, it's up on a shelf, it's quite noticeable. And the, the, the UPF is spilling over the top of it so you can see it. I wonder if we should hide it more so it's not so much in their eye line. But the, I don't know, the, the girls are okay. They don't constantly nag about it. But after dinner, they. Sasha, my three-year-old, will go, blue bowl, blue bowl, you know. So how often does do they ask about it? After dinner, most days, they get something. So, for example, they will get a piece of chewing gum. They like they like bubble gum. So they get hubba bubba yeah. gum or they get, yeah. a, my they get half well. a chocolate bar yeah. or five Tic Tacs or three Haribo or something. You know, that it's not it's not pudding. So Sasha will go, I want pudding, I want dessert. I'm like, That's, the blue bowl is not dessert. Dessert is red honey and peanut butter or yogurt and jam or something. A dessert is not the blue bowl, but they, mm. they have a treat most nights. Okay. So what does your mother-in-law say, think about the blue bowl? Oh, you know, I've never asked her. Well, what did she tell you? <laughs> she I, was just laughing and she said, he's, he's not uh, telling people about the blue bowl. <laughs> I think, you know, my, I think I can say this, you know, my, my, my mother-in-law has, I, I think she would say she has, she has struggled with food as I have, as, as many of us do for many years. And so yeah. I, I think she's a really positive influence in the household where we don't make food shameful. We don't have, uh, food is never banned. Uh, and, and she, I think is a reminder to sort of talk about it always with, with an eye on sensitivity. I think particularly I, I'm, my wife's pregnant. We're going to have three girls and my wife is a, is a journalist in, in fashion. So I'm very aware, particularly in girls that, um, you've got to be very careful how you discuss food, diet, weight, health, yeah. um, good food, bad food. Yeah. Um, and we can talk about that in more detail, mm. but, um, overall, I, th I think Christine approves of what we're doing. I don't know. She never gives any advice. I was just talking about this with Wolfgang on the, on the previous podcast. Yeah. Um, she will, she will not give us advice and it's lovely. Huh. You've written this book, ultra processed, uh, people. And, uh, I'm wondering then why should we care if our food is ultra processed or let's reframe it. Why should we try to avoid it? Well, I don't think anyone should try to avoid it. I don't have an opinion on that. I really don't. People want to eat this. It's fine. Um, why should we all care about it? Because it's the leading cause of early death for human beings. So poor diet has overtaken tobacco. And we know that a poor diet is an industrially processed diet. We're sure about that. Um, so it affects your health and you should know that. And then if you want to keep, keep eating it, genuinely, I, I don't have an opinion on how people should eat. And I have very little view on how they should feed their children. Most parents want their children to be well. They just need information. Yeah. Um, obviously there are, you know, if, there are exceptions to that, but broadly, I, I don't care. Um, we should all care because it affects the planet. So it's the second leading cause of carbon emissions. Our food system is the leading cause of loss of biodiversity. Ultra processed food is made of commodity crops. It's made of four things, rice, wheat, corn, soy, then some fats, palm, sunflower, and a few others, mm. a little bit of dairy and three meats, pork, chicken, beef, and maybe some fish. But, but that's it really. It's got what, eight, nine species of of thing go into it, of all the tens of thousands of things we could eat. 
These crops are grown at enormous scale, mainly in the tropics. We chop down forests in Indonesia to grow palm. We chop down forests in Amazonia to grow soy. Um, and so it makes animals extinct and it causes, it's going to cause changes in climate that will bring about food insecurity. Hmm. So we all do have to care about this. There is a, there is another reason we should care, which is that food has a meaning beyond its, uh, its need to sustain us and give us energy and build be a, a building block for our physical construction. Yeah. Food is the substance that binds us to our community. It binds to our to our history, to our culture, and to people we love, and it is the thing we have in common with people. And food should have meaning and connection. These things are harder to, to evidence, but I think they are really, really important. We all we all know they're important. And when you eat foods that are really have a completely different purpose to creating community and friendship and love and and bonding you to people, when when the purpose of the food is money and it's created by very large, faceless corporations who, who really don't, can't care about human health. I think we, we lose something very specific about our culture. And if you love food like I do and you travel around the world, one of the joys of coming to Norway is you have a food culture here and you eat local food that is about your environment and that food is healthy and it's specifically healthy to this place. Mm. So there's a reason in Scandinavia you eat all this oily fish because uh, oily fish historically was the only source of vitamin D. It's the only thing you can eat. So you had to eat it. There's no, not enough sunlight to sustain vitamin D production. Mm. So you lose all that if you start eating the same food that we eat everywhere else. So that, that's a, it's a kind of detail and it's hard to bring numbers to bear on that, but there will, there, there will be a tragedy that if, if the, if the restaurant chains and the brands that feed us already feed so many of us, displace all our traditional food culture. But um, here in Norway, we eat about 50% ultra-processed, or we buy at least 50% ultra-processed, and they think that children eat even more. Uh, so we're, we're heading uh, towards uh, the UK, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy that we have a food, food culture in Norway, but uh, for example, bread, which is a big part of what we eat here in Norway. We eat it for breakfast, lunch, and the evening snacks. It's not, uh, I would say that maybe 80% would not make it themselves. They buy it in the store. So well, more, I mean, in the UK, more than 95% of our bread. We're also a bread eating nation, you know, yeah. we, all, the, all our sort of cereal agriculture, Northern European nations, we're bread eaters. Mm. And, um, and yeah, our bread is not bread. I mean, bre bread, traditional bread is conceived by, you know, po ancient populations all over the world as, as the stuff that gives us life. I mean, bread, bread is, a, is a metaphor for food. It stands in for all food, breaking bread, you know. And uh, it should have really three ingredients, or maybe you put in some other stuff for flavor or texture. But broadly, it's wheat, salt, and water, and natural yeasts. Yeah. And so I, I don't feel that an emulsified foam with sugar, palm fat, flavorings, colorings, and very low-grade flour should really be called bread. I think it should be called bread-like foam emulsion. <clears throat> We're going to go to why um, ultra-processed <clears throat> food isn't uh, the best for our bodies and our minds. But before that, when we talk about bread... Uh, it's difficult uh, because the bread in here in Norway, at least, it says it's full of fiber, mm -hmm. it's good for you, it's whole grain. Mm -hmm. uh, before the talk today, I had to like I had to uh, Google uh, the the <laughs> bread that is called the children's bread in Norway. What it, it's the ingredients of the children's bread. Oh right, can you read them out? Do you want to hear it? Uh, and it says so. It's Can you so show me many, a picture of it? It's so many labels on it, and it says it's so good for our health. So I was uh, thinking, okay, this must be good. Uh, well, they only show that. Uh, that but okay, it, but this it, is like a standard loaf of loaf. Of yeah, bread. it's a normal bread, and it it uh, the ingredients is water, wheat flour, fully formed wheat, collected dry sunflower seeds, wheat gluten, barley malt extract, yeast, salt, vegetable oil, rapeseed dried wheat, sourdough, flour treatment agents, E300, emulsifier, E471, E472E, enzyme, amylase, hemicellulase, fully hydrogenated vegetable fat, rapeseed, 
and starter culture. Okay. And that's that's the bread that's called the children's bread in Norway. Okay, so we can, there's a lot, I mean, we could now do the next three hours just on that ingredients list yeah. and the ways in which that bread will be uh, less healthy than real bread. Um, but there are a few things that really stand out. So one of the things, the first ingredient is, is uh, flour, fine. Um, but you notice later on that wheat gluten appears. Yeah. So yeah. gluten is the protein from wheat and gluten yeah. is the thing that makes bread strong and stretchy. So high protein flour is the, pro the flour you have to use to make bread. If you make bread, you use a different flour, you use strong high protein flour compared to the cake flour. Cakes are all crumbly. They're not, they're not strong like bread. Hmm. Now, the first ingredient is flour. It's very low quality flour. It's had the gluten taken out of it. It's been highly processed. They then back add the gluten to give absolute control over consistency. So the bread that you buy today, I'm imagining that bread has been available in Norway for many years. It will be the same in 20 years time and it will be the same 20 years ago. And that's because they ne there is never variation with, you know, flour will change its protein, carbohydrate, content season to season according to rain this gives the manufacturer control so it's part of ultra processing so it's always the same it always tastes it the will same always it will never ever there's never ever variation okay. you know apples bananas tomatoes meat milk it should all go up and down you know sometimes you get a slightly sour apple sometimes they're incredibly sweet sometimes fruit is firm or soft natural food has variation according to weather and soil and uh, wind conditions and sunlight um that is not allowed with ultra processed food. So the second ingredient that really alarmed me that I've not heard of it before is amylase. Now yeah. you will remember, I think from either high school or medical school, mm. the experiment where you take white bread and you chew it in your mouth and you notice it starts to become sweet because yeah. this is the first thing you learn. In fact, I did this, I think we did this when we were like 15 at school. Yeah, we did in the it's, high school. It's pre-medical yeah. school. Yeah. You have an enzyme in your saliva, salivary amylase, that yeah. breaks down starch and turns it into glucose. Yeah. So they're putting this enzyme in bread in place of adding sugar. And the enzyme, I suspect, will be working either in the bread as it sits on the shelf or will work during the manufacturing process to create sugar from starch. So it's the bread will be sweet but they don't have to write sugar, but exactly. some of the starch will be turned into sugar. So they exactly. only add, you add starch and amylase, yeah. you end up with sugar, but you haven't had to write sugar on the label. It's so clever. Yeah. Then there's E7, E472E, which is diacetyl tartaric acid esters of mono and diglycerides of fatty acids. So that's one of the most common emulsifiers. It's called Datem. Why do they use that? So um, it, it is exactly how emulsifiers work in bread. No one entirely knows but it's, it helps stop staling. And it's one of the reasons they, they, the bread is very soft and it turns into a slime in your mouth. So, you yeah. know, you eat this bread and it turns into a, a ball uh, and it's very easy to swallow. If you eat, I mean, you know, if I, that you've made me a kind of oat bread here, if I eat this, it doesn't, I chew it and it crumbles and it, it's, it's a very different mouthfeel. It won't disintegrate into a slime. Mm -hmm. I don't think you used any synthetic emulsifiers. No, in this, <laughs> no I did not. Um, <laughs> So emulsifiers are very important in bread for the shelf life, for the texture, and for the softness. But, but I mean, we, that's an amazing list of stuff. But we, Why is there we, oil in there? There should be think oil in this, bread. We think this is uh, good for us. We think this is good for our children. And yesterday I was talking with a friend who uh, I told him that I was um, uh, having you as a guest today. And he was like, oh, can, could you please uh, ask him about this bread? And this was an, another bread that I, uh, he just read the ingredients list. And it says, oat bread, um, it has the, in Norway, we have, we don't have the green light like in England. We have key mark. Key mark says, this is good for you. Okay. Uh, so it's it like has, a health. It has a green key mark on it. Uh, and he's like, when my children eat this bread, it's it's something very funny happens because when they get the bread that I uh, make myself, they eat maybe one or two slices. But my boys, when they get this bread, they can eat eight <laughs> slices yep. in the same meal. Yep. It's amazing. So they this is so this much. is the point: is is industry and the scientists that they pay say. Uh, Chris wants to regulate these healthy foods like this wholemeal bread. Now, some of these breads do contain whole grains. Whole grains are broadly associated with health, but we can put the whole grains in anything. You put whole grains in a chocolate bar, it won't make the chocolate bar healthy. You put whole grains in a chocolate breakfast cereal, it doesn't make it healthy. And if you put whole grains 
in a, an emulsified foam sugar loaf of poor quality wheat flour, it won't make it healthy either. So the, the, the experiment with the bread that's easiest to do is exactly what your friend has done, is, is give your kid a slice of, of bread, of sourdough bread or rye bread, versus a slice of supermarket bread, child's bread. Yeah. They will eat the supermarket bread much, much faster, like twi- at least twice as fast. So I've done this with my kids. I've done it myself. Um, and they will eat far more of it. Now, exactly how the companies are doing that, we know some of. We know that the bread is soft partly because of the emulsifiers, the flour treatment agents, the way it's cooked, the shelf life, the, the sugar, the oil makes it soft. So we know some of it. But the main reason uh, the bread is soft is because it's been engineered over many, many, many iterations by brilliant scientists in the companies to be incredibly edible. Mm. The, the purpose of that bread that you showed me is not to nourish a child. It's not for children. It is to extract money and to get the kids to eat as much as possible. Mm. Because if you're in these bread companies, there's not big margins on food. The companies are obliged to the people that own them. They have to show that they're bigger this quarter than they were last quarter. They have to keep selling more bread. So the bread has to be very edible. Um, That is the purpose of that bread. Whereas when your friend makes his own bread at home, his purpose is not to force to make his children eat 10 slices. You know, his purpose is to fill the kids up and get them out the door to school. Yeah. What happens, you've talked about this before, but what happens uh, with our uh, um, satiety hormones like ghrelin, ghrelin and leptin? What, what happens? Do, does it affect uh, the way we feel hunger and uh, feel that we're full? So... Um, I did an experiment on myself where I ate ultra processed food for a month, a, a, a normal level for a Norwegian teenager or a child. You know, I eighty percent of my calories. Um, 80% percent ultra processed food. Ultra processed food, mm-hmm. and we measured lots of things. But one of the things we measured was my hormonal response to a meal, and what we saw was that the satiety hormones uh, at the end of the meal rise much, much less. So the short term signals there are. I mean, getting in, there is nothing more boring in my view than satiety and hunger hormones. They're incredibly confusing. They all go up and down. There are long-term ones, there are short-term ones. It's very complex. So we measured a couple, um, we measured PYY. And what we saw essentially was the hunger hormones remained pretty high mm. and the satiety hormones don't really change. And that was at the end of the diet. And that was in response to a standard meal. Mm. So what it seems like this food is doing is it's not just hacking your body while you're eating it. It's not just that when you eat a piece of ultra processed food, you get a different hormone response. It seems to be affecting your hormone response to all food. So it's modifying the way your body responds to food. And we don't (laughs) really understand why that is. I think one really interesting idea is that part of the project of ultra processed food is there is UPF for every occasion. So as soon as you get up in the morning, you can have some for breakfast. You then have some as a snack on the way to work. You stop at the gas station at work. You might have a biscuit, a snack before lunch. Then there's ultra processed lunch. You're never, you're never, you're never satisfied, but you're also never hungry. And so the, the mm. constant eating that ultra processed food promotes may be, may be part of the derangement. So it actually makes you just eat more. Yes. So mm. the way we, the way. The thing we are probably surest about with ultra processed food, there's sort of, if we want to be sure of our hypothesis, there are several criteria we have to fill. We've got very good population data that the category of ultra processed food drives health harms. And we've got these big studies, pretty robust. They're not perfect because no big data studies ever are, but they're, they're the kind of studies that we use to link tobacco to cancer. Mm. And, uh, and, and we've got lots of them. But to really say we're sure that the food is causing the problem, we then have to go, is it plausible? Have we got experimental evidence? Is it mechanistically uh, logical they would do this? And actually it is. So the best evidence is that ultra processed food is generally very soft and it's very energy dense. Now it's soft because humans quite like eating soft food. It's incredibly easy. So if you think of those products Wherever you are throughout the day, whether it's the soft bread, the breakfast cereal that turns into a into a sludge, the um, the biscuits that crumble very quickly, uh, the the sandwiches you eat for lunch, all of it is soft. Even the UPF pizzas, the burgers, the crisps. I mean, you think of crisps as not being soft because they're hard, but as soon as you eat them, they dissolve in your mouth. You mm. know, 
The softness means you consume calories at a rate your body can't keep up with. Mm. And we've known since the mid 1990s, we've done lots and lots of human experiments that soft energy dense food drives excess consumption. You, essentially, you've eaten a thousand calories. I mean, if you think of a fast food meal, thousand to 1500 calories, so easy to consume, you can eat that meal in f less than 10 minutes. You know, it's and so it would, fast. It would take two hours if you ate cabbage and broccoli. If you, if you ate 2000 calories of like a steak, Yeah. If you ate a, a steak sandwich, yeah. so a piece of meat between low, pieces of sourdough bread with some some salad on the side versus the same number of calories in a, a burger between in a brioche bun where the meat's all chopped up and, and the bun's emulsified and you eat french fries, same number of calories, you, you know, it will take you a tenth of the time. Yeah. Know? And you're not, there's all that social stuff that goes with food that you stop doing. So you don't release the fullness hormones. Now the, the softness is important, but the energy density is really important as well. And the food, so we think of things like, um, a lot of ultra processed food doesn't feel dense. There's like rice cakes or popcorn. It doesn't feel dense. It's per gram, it's incredibly energy dense because it's bone dry. So although a big bag of popcorn doesn't feel heavy, per gram of it, it's got a lot, a lot of energy. Hmm. And this means that you are putting mainly the fat and sugar into your gut much, much quicker than your body is adapted to eat it. And we think that that, is, that drives the excess consumption because you don't feel full. We think that's also what's driving addiction. Mm. So that's kind of one of the main mechanisms we think that ultra processed food is driving weight gain. In terms of all those other health outcomes like cancers and inflammation, we have to look at other aspects of the food to point to why we think they're causing those problems. But we have really good, plausible evidence in every instance. Uh, so th two things there. You you mentioned addiction. We have to talk about that because I think a lot of people can see that they get, that they feel like they want more of it. They get cravings from ultra processed foods. And, but before that, you mentioned that your body can't keep up. And I think that's a, a very important uh, statement because you're giving your body something that it is not um, made for. It has never yeah. ever been made food like this. Yeah. And uh, just uh, humans are 300,000 years or something. We've never eaten this before the last 20 years, 30 years. So depending on when you start, yes, yeah. so it yeah. hasn't been a big part of our diet yeah. for more than four or five decades in, in the States and less in Norway. I mean, yeah. in Norway, you haven't been eating it for too long. No, we haven't. So our body can't keep up with it. It doesn't understand what happens, but it gets all these pleasure hormones and we want more of it. And a lot of people feel like it's their own fault when they can't stop eating it. Yeah. Because we have free will and we can decide what we want to eat uh, whenever we want to eat it. So many people that I meet in my patient office, they say that uh, I, I just don't understand why I can't stop eating it. Yeah. I know it's not good for the me. The self-stigma is so big. And, and in fact, the, the people who argue most against... So I, I've been very clear when, when I, in my book, when I talk on podcasts, willpower is not a part of this discussion. It should not be a part of a policy discussion. It has no role to play. People who gain weight do not have less willpower than people who do not gain weight. They mm. have genetic differences driving different food motivations. Mm. The argument against me is often from people who live with excess weight because they feel like the evidence of their own life is they are weak-willed because they pass a restaurant or yeah. there, are, there are biscuits on the table and they end up eating them. Yeah. I would say if people are listening, people in li are listening, may feel skeptical about this. They may say, well, you know, they could, I choose not to eat the biscuit. They could also choose not to eat the biscuit. To get inside the head of people who have genes for obesity uh, is fairly easy. You have to imagine that you're thirsty and there is a bottle of water on the table in front of you. Now you can resist that water for some time, but eventually it becomes impossible not to drink the water or your entire psyche is on the water because you want it so badly. And that is like being inside the brain of someone with genes for weight gain. And I know that because I have those genes. Yeah. I've been tested by lots of colleagues who studied the genetics of obesity. I have all the genetic risk factors. Now I'm protected by all kinds of things in my environment, but I'm not protected by willpower. If you put, if you put the foods I love in front of me, I'll, 
I won't be able to talk to you. I'll just be, be focused on them as a smoker would be on a pack of cigarettes or uh, someone who is addicted to a drug of abuse would be focused on a, you know, a pile of cocaine in front of them. So th we know these foods are very addictive. So they are addictive because it's there's so many people that say that it's not addiction. And you know that because like food a, is something we all have to eat. So the, the dilemma for a long time has been there have been two problems with with saying with food addiction. First of all, food doesn't contain addictive molecules. Now some people say that sugar is addictive. I don't think there is much evidence for that in terms of if we have a bowl of sugar on the table here. Neither of us want to eat the sugar. If you put sugar in water, it becomes less delicious, not more delicious. It's not, sugar is not actually very nice. You know, you might eat a bit of honey, but no one eats spoonfuls of sugar or very rarely. Fat is also not addictive. You know, we don't, none of us eat butter by the spoonful or drink oil. Hmm. Now, if you mix fat and sugar, a little something happens. But if you mix olive oil and sugar or rapeseed oil or lard or butter and sugar, it's not very nice. Again, no one really does it. To drive the addiction, you have to wrap up your sugar fat molecules in a special package with texture, flavor, color, branding, a clever box, an elaborate shape, uh, a concept, um, flavor enhancers, salt, acid. There's a whole set of processing, we call it ultra processing, that drives the addiction. Hmm. In the end, the molecules that give you the reward are the fat and sugar, but they have to be put in a package that delivers them correctly. And this is true for almost all addictive molecules. So um, if you think of nicotine, we think of nicotine as the addictive molecule in a cigarette. The only format in which nicotine is addictive is an ultra processed cigarette. So if you um, have tobacco paper and uh, crushed up tobacco leaf with accelerants, um, with uh, uh, lots of the delivery devices used by tobacco companies. That's what drives addiction. Traditional tobacco is used in indigenous communities in North America in the pre-Columbus era. They weren't all addicted to tobacco products. Chewing tobacco is not very addictive. And nicotine gum is not addictive. Nicotine gum we use to treat addiction. And we see the same for methamphetamine, extremely addictive when you snort it or you smoke it. Methylphenidate is a drug we use to treat children with attention problems. Mm. You can go through almost every drug of abuse and the speed of delivery is incredibly important. So ultra processed food is taking molecules that are rewarding, but not addictive in, in I mean, this, this has fat and sugar in it. it. It is not addictive, it's delicious, but I'm, I can sit here without, it's not craving irresistible it. without craving yeah. it. I mean, I, these are quite good, but um, <laughs> let's leave that to one side. Um, it's when when you wrap them up in a rapid delivery pack, package, that's when it becomes addictive. And the, the, mm. the food companies know this. So that's kind of the, the light science of addiction. If anyone's in any doubt, you know, the way we diagnose addiction, you know this, it's not complicated. You ask people questions and you really only need one question. And the question is, do you find that you continue using uh, a, a behavior or a substance that you know is harming you mentally, physically or socially? in spite of knowing it's harmful and in spite of trying to quit it? And if the answer is yes to that question, whether it's alcohol, tobacco, gambling, sex, then you, are, then you, you, you may have an addiction. And we, you can ask some more questions, but we don't need to put people in brain scanners to diagnose addiction. So any, anyone listening can work out, have they tried to quit food and that they think is harming them and have they failed? And if that yeah. case, yeah, you, you have an addiction. But the problem here is that most people know that smoking isn't good for them or gambling, but uh, most people don't under understand that um, the concept with ultra processed food, it's, it's a difficult concept or more difficult to understand than nicotine or uh, yeah, gambling. The most, the most important thing that the tobacco industry did to slow progress, because we, the scientific community knew that cigarettes caused lung cancer in the 50s. And yet effective regulation took six decades, 60 years. Yeah. The tobacco industry, their most important product wasn't cigarettes, it was doubt. It was confusion. Yeah. So they set up this tobacco research group and they said, look, we're gonna study this. We're not, we're worried, we're not sure, let's. And that's the state I think people are in. The confusion is around, oh, I, I keep reading these articles in the paper that say that the whole grain UPF bread is actually good for me. Yeah. Well, who produced that? Who's the scientist quoted? They're, mm. they're always funded by industry. Mm. So I think the, I think people find ultra processed food quite a simple concept to grasp. I think that's why Marit Colby's work here has been so successful because yeah. I think intuitively 
people are like, oh yeah, long weird chemical ingredients wrapped up in plastic kind of sold to me by some giant corporation. It doesn't feel good. You know, I think people, people grasp it quite quickly. Our parents told us it wasn't healthy. Our grandparents, when this food first appeared in the 60s and the 70s, they were worried about it. Yeah. So I think people do get it. The confusion comes from literally industry-funded scientists in the press going, oh, how could, how could processing be harmful? Yeah. Humans have been processing food exactly. for over a million years. Exactly. And they are... The complexity of that is they're completely right. I agree with those scientists. But we're not talking about processing. We're talking about a set of molecules and technologies that are brand new that, as you say, we've never encountered before in our past. Uh, but like Marit Kolbe, she's done such an important job here in Norway. She meets a lot of resistance from even the government saying that um, it's not the ultra-processed food that's the bad guy here. It's the fat it's the sugar it's the way people eat their food it's uh, everyone should have a choice uh, there's a lot of resistance here i mean i can sp let me see if i can do this briefly the people who go oh the problem is high fat salt sugar food well we we can dismantle this argument in several ways like that that food is a problem humans have of kind of my age have for a long time been able to gain weight if they if they're wealthy and they eat home cooked food. Yes, there have always been men in their forties who get big, you know, Henry VIII, our King of England was, yeah. was big. Yeah. We're not very interesting. You know, we, that, that's not the population health problem. The population health problem is with children and the fact that 60% of people are now living with overweight. So yeah. overweight people, it was, it was people who live with overweight, it was two to 5%, now it's 60%. So that's what's caused In that. Norway, 23%, only 23% of men Adults are normal weight in Norway. Really? So it is. Six, so I, I, I always think of. So in Norway, the weight goes up very quickly. You are still tall in Norway, but I think we will see you shrink. We haven't been introduced to it as quickly as you were. I mean, we, we've, we've been eating this for a long time. So we yeah. see stunting in British children. You know, they're, they're, they're this much shorter. They're like nine centimeters shorter than Norwegian children at the age of five. Okay, so if you put a class of Norwegian five-year-olds next to a class of British five-year-olds, you'd be like, oh, wow, those kids look a year younger or more than a year younger hmm. in, in the UK. So, But is that linked to ultra-processed foods? Yes, yeah, yeah. What was, give me your competing theory. I've no Genetics, <laughs> migration. So people have said, yeah. oh, well, you yeah. have um, shorter populations migrating in the UK. No, no, no. The epidemiologists control for all this. Huh. You know, we know it isn't an influx of people from nations where there's more malnutrition. It is not that. It's diet. <laughs> what else affects height? I mean, you, I didn't ask you this, you know. Yeah. Air pollution, maybe, a little bit, sure. Um, poverty, perhaps. Bad housing, yeah, maybe. But... No, height is determined by diet, really. And so it is, the, 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 one of the arguments used by industry is going, well, you're taking you know, calories away from, from people who, who are hungry, who don't have money. And it's like, no, no, no. The poorest people in both our countries still, almost the poorest people everywhere in the global north have access to excess calories. The issue is not calories, it's that those cal the excess calories go hand in hand with malnutrition. Yeah. So we see the overweight and the stunting in the mm. same bodies. You know, that that's the issue. So mm. when you say it's fat, salt, sugar, you say, well, we, look, we have had, in Norway, in the UK, we've had fat, salt and sugar on our kitchen tables for a hundred years. They, they've always been cheap. You know, even people with without much money have always been able to afford you know, fat, salt, and sugar at home. Where was all the childhood obesity 50, 60 years ago? It didn't exist, even though we had all this fat, salt, and sugar. It's the ultra processing. It's when they're combined by industry into a packet that you can afford, that's aggressively marketed to you with a health claim, with the excess flavoring, with the emulsifiers, with the texture changes, with the softness. In these perfect formulations, you know, we all know that if, you, if you're a cook, you can make fatty, sugary, salty food that's disgusting. You know, it's not nice. You have to get the ratios perfect. Yeah. You have to add the acids. You have to get the flavors, the texture, the, the look of the thing. It's very hard to do this, this cooking. It's science. It's science, right. And the, the companies are good at it. So it is, you know, the other thing we know is that in many traditional diets, so we've got very, very good evidence that traditional foods that are minimally processed are extremely good for you. 
all the traditional diets we've ever studied. Fish diets in East Asia, yeah. um, it, it, Mediterranean Vegan diets, diets vegetarian diets, yeah. South Asia, you know, mm. no, Arctic diets that are mainly protein and fat, you know, extensively mm. studied. And um, even the French diet of red wine and cheese mm. and cream and butter, everyone's, oh, it's, it's a paradox, the French diet. So there's no exception to it. The, the French diet is not quite as high in saturated fat as everyone says, but it's broadly they eat real food. That yeah. is the paradox in France. And the only diet that we've ever studied that brings negative health outcomes, aside from certain forms of malnutrition, is an industrially processed diet. So there is no other category of food. There are two categories of food we've got evidence for. Real, traditional, whole, minimally processed foods are good for you, and ultra-processed food is bad for you. There is no evidence that perhaps you, someone will write in and point me to a paper I've missed. There is no other definition of unhealthy food that has any evidence at all. We have evidence for nutrients, fat, salt, sugar. I broadly agree with that evidence. I think sugar does drive excess weight, salt drives heart harms, um, fat drives cardiovascular disease, ex excess saturated fat. Okay, I, I believe all that. I'm not trying to throw all that out. But I think the ultra processing, the marketing of that stuff is what really is is the big problem. The, mm. the final bit of evidence, just to go, I just want to beat people over the head with this because the argument has no validity. So the final bit of evidence is that we have lots of data that people who buy fat, salt and sugar in ingredient form are much healthier than when you buy the same ingredients uh, in industrially processed food. Hmm. And the epidemiology data, and we talked about this last night, all makes adjustments for fat, salt, sugar, and fiber. And the effect seems to be the processing, not... So that obviously scientists are not morons, right? The teams at Harvard, at Imperial, the epidemiologists, the best epidemiologists in the world, when they study this food, the question they're asking is, is this just fatty, salty, sugary food? Do we, like, do we need to reinvent the wheel here? The question they're asking is, is the processing important? And in all, so my PhD student did an analysis of this, and he looked at all those statistical adjustments in a big systematic review that we published together, and he showed that in every single paper, they make, almost every paper, they make adjustments for the nutrients, and they see the effect remains the same. Mm. doesn't matter how much salt fat or sugar you're consuming when it comes to outcomes like early death. What's, what matters is if they're in ultra-processed form. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that fat, salt, and sugar play no role, but I am saying ultra-processing is really important. Industrial processing drives excess intake. How Sorry, the food is, is made. But you've mentioned some, uh, some uh, risk factors by eating ultra-processed foods addiction. Mm -hmm. uh, I've read your book and there's, could you give us a list of what ultra processed food is uh, related to now? Mm -hmm. I'm now eating your minimally processed <laughs> cake. Mm. Hold on. My roll that I just made for you and your so mother-in-law. I thought she so was good. here. She's I got uh, an email from Jarl saying that she would be here. So I thought, oh, she needs I'll some more food. Her. Yeah. Maybe. maybe. <laughs> she hadn't told you about the blue bowl. Um, so we we have good prospective evidence that ultra-processed food is associated with dementia, anxiety and depression, cancers, de death from cancers, um, especially bowel and breast cancer, I think, um, inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's disease, cardiovascular mm -hmm. disease, strokes, heart attacks, metabolic disease like type 2 diabetes, yeah. weight gain, obesity, and early death from all causes. Yeah. So that's what the prospective big study data shows. And if you start to ask, well, why? Well, we've got the softness, the energy density. Then we can look at the additives. We've mm. got emulsifiers, non-nutritive sweeteners, modified starches, and we've got quite good evidence. They seem to be uh, harmful in lots of ways. Yeah. Um, and then we've got the most important thing is this engineering process where this food is not produced with any... There is no incentive in the, in the production system to care about human health. If you make food that immediately poisons people, then, then you get in trouble. If you make food that drives weight gain, there is no penalty for the food companies. In fact, they get a reward because people buy more food. So the, the big problem is this testing of the food. You know, if, if, if you were a food company and you're making your oat, oat thing, so you used eggs, butter, uh, Oats, banana, banana, 
Okay. And, yeah. So the first Salt. thing I do is be like, okay, this is this is a nightmare. We can't keep making this. We can't afford the butter. We can't afford the eggs. So we'll put in an emulsifier. We'll put in some palm fat. Bananas, well, we can use banana flavoring. Uh, we can bulk it up with some some modified starches. Let's, I mean, oats are expensive. Let's just put in fewer oats for a tiny bit of texture and a health claim and get the chia seeds out of there. No one cares about that. And we'd, it would look more or less the same. And let's sweeten it up and add loads of salt because we know that'll, that'll drive excess hmm. consumption. Hmm. So the, the, it would very quickly, we'd have something that looked like this that would be called the same thing, but it would then be tested. You do variant one, and you'd make two batches, A and B. And then we'd feed these to 100 people. And the thing that everyone I spoke to in the food industry confirmed is that the thing we measure is do they eat this one quicker than they eat this one? And if this one, which has, I don't know, some slightly different flavorings, a bit more salt, or this one has a bit more sugar, if this is the one they eat quicker, that's the one we put on the shelf. But next year, we're going to make a new one. We're going to make variant C. Now, this one, we've got a slightly different emulsifier. So we've hacked the price down, but we've added some more maltodextrin. We've got that amylase in there, so it's sweeter. This one sells better. That one goes in the bin. We're now selling this one. Every year, we reformulate until we've got something you can't stop eating. Huh. So every, this, pro, this thing you have made has thousands of measurable properties from its mouthfeel, its viscosity, the shear forces, the texture, the flavor, salt, pH, like... Thousands of things. Every single, you haven't optimized any of them. You've just made food. Mm. The food company, every one of those thousand properties will be absolutely dialed up to 11 until I cannot stop eating it. But Chris, this is... <laughs> it's, it's not a conspiracy. But it's just no, how companies but it, work. it just sounds so terrifying because um, I'm thinking about the children that are growing up right now and eating so much ultra processed foods. I remember in medical school, there's a moment I will never forget. I asked my, uh, there was a professor in gastrology uh, and she was saying that before she diagnosed ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, inflammatory bowel diseases, three times a month. And now, 20 years later, she diagnoses this three times a day. It has exploded. There's the, an epidemic of cancer in young people. Yeah, yeah. And we're just going, there's a whole load of stuff about Western life. We just go with the diseases of Western life, lifestyle diseases. Mm. And we, we've we sort of gone, well, I don't know, Western life, we, I don't know, this, we've got clean water and some stuff. So I guess we just have to accept all that. I don't see why. Like, if you have gastrointestinal disease, it is extremely likely that it is being caused by the stuff you put in the gastrointestinal tube, kind of obviously. But they get the message that the food has nothing to do with it. I mean, I just... What we have is this, you know, one of the things that some of my critics go, they go, well, the emulsifier evidence is all in rats and mice. Yeah. It's not quite true, but a lot of it is rats and mice. And rats and mice aren't people. And that is true. But when we test drugs, remember, if the drug works in rats and mice and lowers their blood pressure or makes them live longer, we can say, ah, oh, but rats and mice aren't people. We do need to test it in pe people. If the drug kills the rats and mice, we go, oh, well, we better not give it to the people. So the risk benefit analysis changes. If it does the rats and mice harm, mm. that should be enough evidence to go, well, we probably don't want to give it to the people. Exactly. And uh, uh, food uh, additives. And, and not the children. Right. I mean, why is the burden of proof on you, me, yeah. Marit, like this small team of people who have, I mean, there's no money in any of this. I, I can't get funding for the, but we do get funding for our search from, from the government and things, but we don't, I can't get funding from a big food company in the way that, that other people can. So why is the burden of proof on me to prove that synthetic emulsifiers are harmful? We don't need them in our food. The burden of proof should be on the companies. Mm. Of course, I won't accept company evidence. So that evidence needs to go through a stringent regulator like the European Food Safety Agency or, you know, it should be like drugs. The companies should pay for it and an independent body should scrutinize it. I hope we will be there in a couple of years, but it will probably it take 20 be. years. It took, it took 60 years with tobacco. Yeah. I feel with food, people are so, people feel gaslit. Do you, do you have this expression yeah, in, yeah, yeah, yeah. in a way where yeah. it's like the companies are turning up and down the lights and saying yeah. that nothing's happening. Mm. And we have been sold now since the early eighties, even in Norway, you've been sold this food. That's like the eighties, it was low fat. We all kept gaining weight. In the 2000s, it became low sugar. 
we all kept gaining weight. At some point we go, well, we, we've taken out the fat, we've taken out the sugar, we've increased the fiber, we've added all the vitamins, and yet still our, our, our children in the UK at the age of 10 are living with 20, 25% obesity, not just overweight. So at some yeah. point we have to go, oh, there's nothing else much we can do to the food. It, it is clearly just the industrial production. So we know, you, you say that we have enough evidence to say that ultra processed food is correlated now with so it's many causal. of like, the- I think we can, at some point we can mince around and go, well, it's strongly associated yeah. as a category of food. Yeah. Ultra processed fo- food causes negative health outcomes. Like Now, dementia, we, dementia, cardiovascular anxiety, disease. depression, cardiovascular disease, metabolic disease, weight gain, early death. We, yeah. I think, so we, you may remember this from your epidemiology training. There are these things called the Bradford Hill criteria. So when we say, so if we notice smokers get lung cancer, it could be the cigarettes giving them lung cancer, but smokers also buy lots of matches. So people who buy matches get lots of lung cancer. So mm. is it the matches or is it the cigarettes? Well, mm. the epidemiologists can do some of the work and figure out if it's the matches or the cigarettes, but it's actually quite hard to work out if it's matches or cigarettes from the population data. Yeah. So then we go to the next stage, which is we say, have we got experimental evidence? Like, could we imagine how a match could cause lung cancer versus a cigarette could cause lung cancer? <gasps> then we go, well, we know what's in the smoke. In rats, it causes cancers. We know those things in cells are carcinogens and you are inhaling the smoke into your lungs, whereas the match is kind of out here. So it's probably the cigarette, not the matches. So at some point we, we never proved that cigarettes caused lung cancer, but we satisfied these Bradford Hill criteria of, um, you know, the association is strong and consistent. It's graded, it's dose dependent. The more ultra processed food you eat, the greater the harms. It's plausible and it's backed up by experimental evidence. And once you've mm-hmm. satisfied those criteria, which we have, you go, okay, it's it's causal. So and why aren't uh, the governments in every country now labeling ultra processed food like they're doing in some countries in South America? Um, in very simple terms, because of food industry influence, because the food industry, the you remember the 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 annual marketing budget of one of these companies is more than the entire operating budget of the World Health Organization. So the, the companies have huge power. The companies fund scientists on your government panel. I, I'm not sure of this in Norway. I understand there has been an investigation that may reveal that some of the government scientists have relationships with industry. In the UK, there are 15 scientists on our government scientific advisory committee on nutrition. Half of them have past or present links with food companies that make ultra processed mm. food. One of them works inside the food industry. He's the industry representative on the committee. Why do you have a food industry scientist inside your regulatory committee? It's insane. You wouldn't you wouldn't have a tobacco company scientist sitting on a government committee about tobacco policy. You wouldn't have an oil industry scientist sitting within well you might, but but you shouldn't. So um they the industry controlled the charities that make policy our British Nutrition Foundation. Sounds so credible, doesn't it? How, how the British Nutrition yeah. Foundation, they're, they're a body dedicated to uh, helping uh, the population, the public and policymakers create evidence-based nutrition policy. They are majority funded by companies like Coca-Cola, McDonald's, Nestle, Danone, our big supermarkets. Oh, that so, sounds so scary. It, it sounds so difficult to do anything about, but for the listeners- But we did it with tobacco. Oh, sorry, for the yeah, listeners, sorry. Yeah, yeah so ahead. for, because I'm, um, Uh, I think it's important to see the light in the tunnel here. Like what what can we do okay. and how can we um, help at least the children in- So in I think there are two, there are, for, the, for the listeners individually, I think the first thing to say is bit, many people listening will be a little bit worried, but that they will have the ability to cut down and They'll just be like, oh, wow, we're eating all this bread. We'll just switch to sourdough. We can afford it. Our kids will make our kids eat it. Not a big deal. So some people are going to find it easy and they just need knowledge. Yeah. Some people are really going to be struggling. They are going to be like people trying to quit cigarettes or alcohol. And to those people, the first thing I'd say is, you know, it really is not your fault. This food is very, very sophisticated. I tried to write the book in a way that will help people quit. So I, I did it using a a psychological technique that's quite well evidenced where instead of telling anyone, there's no advice in my book. It's about eat the food while you read because the best way of understanding ultra processed food is to eat it. Yeah. 
Yeah. And you'll re- realise quickly, it all tastes more or less the same. It's all made of the same stuff. It's all it's all very salty and sweet and acidic. So like whether you're eating a pizza or a cookie or a soda or a burger, it's, it's actually the same flavour profiles in all of it. Hmm. Um, it's simple food. It makes you feel terrible. You sleep badly. So by the end of the book, I hope that people living with addiction have more tools to quit. And they will also understand, we know from tobacco, if you're struggling with cigarettes, understanding how tobacco companies work and what they want and that they hate you and they want to kill you is really important. <laughs> they make money. Tobacco companies make money from killing you. Yeah, that yeah, is, yeah. it's quite weird that we allow an industry to exist that just simply profits from killing people. And we know that cigarettes aren't fun. We have lots of industries like this. So the food industry also know they know they're making addictive food. So we have a cereal in the UK called Crave. Mm. Pringles, the slogan was, once you pop, you can't stop. Mm. There's lots of addiction in the marketing of the food. So mm. they know they're harming people. You know, they're, these are nutrition companies. They know exactly what they're doing. So, um, so if people are living with addiction, then treating the food as an addictive substance may be helpful. Eat while you learn about it. Read your ingredients list. And some people may find abstinence, if they can afford it and they have time to cook real food, they may find abstinence easier than moderation, just as some people find abstinence from alcohol and Hmm. tobacco easier. Hmm. Um, But when it comes to kids, I mean, it it is a nightmare because our kids are submerged in this stuff. It is marketed to them constantly. There are no warnings on it. There are cartoon characters. Hmm. And all the breakfast cereal, it's like this stuff isn't just safe for kids. It's been designed for kids to support their health and nutrition. There are all these claims. Um, So I try and not have too much of it in the house I don't ban any of it because even though it's not a great way of, of forging a community, this is the food their friends eat and I don't want them to be weird. So my kids are allowed, you know, when they go to a birthday party, they can have whatever they want. The mm. only thing I really try and get them to not have is fizzy drinks, you know, is, is soda pop. Um, but other than that, they nothing's banned. Y- yesterday you, s- you, you said uh, at the talk that English kids... Uh, Kids in England uh, drink about, what, what was it? One can One of can. artificially sweetened drink every day at the age of three. At the age of three the years of three. old. Yeah, and I have a three-year-old. and I, So my three-year-old's very small. Uh, I mean, all three-year-olds are small. So it's the equivalent of me drinking two or three cans every day. That's crazy. But she's more vulnerable because she's developing. You know, I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm kind of fixed. You can't really perturb me too much. Um, she's very vulnerable to what these drinks do. There's so much we don't understand. These intensely sweet molecules may be changing preference for other sweet things. So they may drive you to then seek sugar in other places. Mm. They may make bitter, sour fruit and vegetables less palatable. If you're used to these things with extreme sweetness, you know, the non-nutritive sweeteners are hundreds or thousands of times sweeter than sugar. Um, if you then eat an apple or an orange, they're not that sweet com- by comparison. So it may alter their their desire to, to engage with real food. And then we don't understand what high levels of non-nutritive sweeteners do to kids in the long term. I think it is very obvious that your tongue is an early warning system, right? Your tongue is not a fun, it's not a thing for, for fun. You haven't evolved taste and um flavor detectors in your nose and mouth uh, for for giggles. You know, you've evolved them because they're very important for evolution. Your smell is the first uh, warning system about food because it tells you, you remember what happened last time you ate this food. If I put delicious food that you've had before in front of you now, you would feel physiological changes in your body. We don't understand them very well. You start secreting digestive enzymes. You change uh, the the hormones in your blood that modify your blood sugar and your fat metabolism. Mm. You'll start salivating. You know, your stomach starts churning. So smell is the first thing. When you put food in your mouth, immediately your body is assessing how bitter is it, how toxic is it? Because all food contains, especially plants, contain toxins that your liver is going to have to process. How sweet is it? How much sugar am I going to have to deal with? How much fat have I got to deal with? What's the protein content? The umami is telling your body about the amino acids that are, that are, on, the, that are on the way. Hmm. So if you put food in the mouth that tastes fatty, but the fat is all modified starch and synthetic gums. It tastes sweet, but the sweetness is all non-nutritive sweeteners. It tastes umami, savory, but there's no protein in it. It's just uh, glutamate, inosinate, and guanylate. 
um, flavor enhancers. What kind of confusion does this create inside? We know almost nothing about it other than the sweeteners, which we think are are not harmless. Um, the rest of it, I think we should be worried, but no, no, one's, no one's ever asked these questions. They seem, among the scientists who study them, people are really worried, but to investigate them costs millions of pounds and simply no one is investigating what is the effect of adding, you know, gums instead of fats. In Norway, we actually recommend d drinking diet sodas instead yeah, of, of uh, normal sodas. And we even had a, this, uh, we have uh, this program on uh, our, on Anarko, which is the biggest, um, what do you call it? TV uh, National Public no, Yeah, National Public I love that we have another <laughs> podcaster in the room that you're I'm talking so, to. I'm it's so, so happy we got to uh, I was like, do we have borrow. to be secret that Wolfgang is here? <laughs> no, Wolfgang is there. And he's fixing the Let's cameras. bring Wolfgang into this discussion. <laughs> you should have had a microphone, Wolfgang. Uh, no. I'm yeah. Just a producer now, so, but uh, did you see the show Folkopplysningen? Yes. Where they said that uh, diet sodas, it, it's no problem at all. They even put the child in a bathtub full of <laughs> diet sodas, I think. Okay. Uh, and wasn't I mean, you, it you know, you like trained that? in dermatology, like a bath of phosphoric acid. I oh, maybe I they didn't do it. No, they put them in sugar or something. But e either way, they said that there was no problem drinking diet sodas because it's no calories, it's nothing, it's, it's you just okay can't, for us. You cannot know anything about the human body and make that claim. Yeah. You cannot think that putting intense sweet taste on the tongue and then no sugar arrives is neutral. You cannot think that drinking, drinking strong acids does not have any effect on your body. Mm. You, you, you can't imagine this stuff. And mainly they also contain, they almost all contain addictive caffeine as well, which... Yeah. Yeah, so, and it disrupts your sleep and a right. lot. And it's unnecessary. It's drinking fluid that your body isn't asking for. It's like, what? I just cannot understand that. And what do you think, Volkan? Do you think uh, that in Norway we we don't think that diet sodas are harmful, or what do you think? I think it's uh, just like the banana and fruit debate. If we find something comforting that uh, we can substitute our um, uh, the evil stuff like coke and soda and chocolate and everything yeah. and we found like uh, a health alternative yeah we stick to that and we believe and we trust that we that want to believe it so that's that's the solution for our uh, sweetness craving i think yeah i think yeah do, i mean there's a discussion about are they more harmful than sugar sodas I differ a little bit from some of my colleagues. So some of my colleagues who I really trust in the States, you know, very senior nutritional scientists would say they, f some of them feel very confident that they are better than the sugary sodas. I, I feel that we have much, we know what sugar does. We know how it harms us. Mm. And I, I would probably- We know the ramifications of it now. I but. would probably rather my kids drank a sugary soda than an, than an artificially sweetened one. But I think both, what we what we know is that the sugary ones are harmful and I feel like the non-sugary ones are about as harmful. They, they I might agree. be, a, I think if someone said, I strongly feel they're a little bit better, I'd be like, okay, I buy that. I don't, I don't mm. care. They're yeah. both equally harmful. Yeah. And uh, The not. problem is that people think that there's one yeah. harmful and one yeah. not harmful and that we can drink it as water. So, no, it, yeah. I mean, in, well, put it this way, the scientists who've written the, the nutrition policies, the excellent nutrition policies in South and Central America, many of those policies have non-nutritive sweeteners get an octagon warning symbol on the cans. So there are very senior government nutrition scientists around the world who feel strongly enough about this to put a warning label on artificially hmm. sweetened products. So, it will be interesting to see what happens here in Norway and uh, England. Uh before you are a very busy guy and I'm so lucky to have you here and I'm so lucky that I got to uh, borrow uh, Wolfgang Wies uh, office today studio uh, but yesterday I posted on my Instagram that you were coming and I asked if someone had questions oh did you and I got I I probably be, 300 questions so we don't have time to go through all of them but I wrote some can you of them send them now. to me on I've got to, I've got to, I find social media is ultra processed. It is for me extremely addictive. I, I struggle with my phone and my apps. So yeah. I try and be abstinent 
quite a lot. Yeah. So um, uh, I wonder if I, if you can send them to me. Anyway, we, we, we're in touch. So I se- can send, send me them some to questions you. and I can see if I can Absolutely. do something on Insta. Yeah, because there's a lot of great questions. And I think my listeners are more interested in health than the main population. But I hope this, I, I would wish that you, what you're saying would reach out to everyone in Norway because it's so but important. But your listeners, my book will of course be read by the people who least, least need the information. Like the people who buy my book are generally eating yeah, five, 10% ultra processed food. Um, but those people are the campaigners, they're the activists. They often have resource, power, the ear of politicians, they they have influence. And so they they often spearhead uh, policy change. So I'm I'm mm. I'm happy to speak to kind of all levels yeah. so that so that you can you can because we you need this structure to change and anyway but i feel like um, a part of my heart is always with my patients and a lot of my patients would not get this knowledge if they hadn't gone to me as a medical doctor with their health issues so i wish that this information was highly available for everyone and that's my purpose to make it as available as possible but I've seen in my practice so many times people getting better from all kinds of diseases when they change what they eat. And I even tracked 10 people for half a year, just seeing what happens to people when they stop all, don't eat ultra processed foods, they eat whole grains, they eat vegetables, what happened to them after six months. And it was incredible to see like one of the participants, she had a very, um, um, what do you call alvorly? Um, what's alvorly? Serious, Serious uh, <laughs> kidney problem, and she got so much better from yeah. her kidney failure. Oh, it's uh, it, well, Marit picked me up on this last night. I forgot to mention they are associated with kidney disease as well for reasons we don't understand. I don't think. Yeah, and I, I could see month by month for her, and I just want to emphasize that. There's, there, it's not anyone's fault if they eat 100% ultra processed food now because no. the information hasn't been uh, available for everyone. Yeah, and real food is expensive. And if you are dry, if you're on a long drive on the motorway, I bet in Norway it is nearly impossible to buy real food. You no, know, if it's impossible. You, know. you you won't get even fruit on the highway. But um, what I'm trying to say is we we don't have to. It's important not to shame the people that are eating this or giving this to their children because everyone wants the best for their children. Yeah. Everyone. That's almost like the most, I would say if people only get one thing from reading my book, it would be that you should not shame or stigmatize anyone, frankly, about anything they do, really, if it doesn't yeah. affect you, but particularly yeah. not around food and weight. You know, that is the most important. And doctors, doctors are horrible to people who live with excess weight. You know, we've got lots of data. We give them less time we treat them badly, we patronize them. You know, doctors are often a big part of the problem. Mm. Yeah, but I can read that through all throughout your book that you're very conscious about this, and that makes me so happy that you're you're talking about this in such a, a respectful way because uh, people try to do their best yes. at all times. And if this information can go out and change someone's diet, they would quickly feel it. They would feel that they're, they get more energy, they, get, um, they feel better, their weight might normalize, they, uh, they can see it on their skin, on their bowel, like everything changes once you change your diet. But to do that, you have to get the knowledge because if not, you will buy the cereal which says, high in fiber and low in salt. It's great for you and your family. It, it's difficult to navigate in this jungle of information if you, you're not as direct as you are, Chris. So I'm very, very happy that you're doing this work because I know that you get a lot of resistance and it's it must be difficult. Well, it's, it's very nice to hear that. I mean, I have some very wonderful allies who keep me, who keep me on the straight and narrow. I mean, I think the the most important thing is a community of healthcare professionals who do not work with the food industry. Who do, like I speak, I have friends who work in the food industry. I go and talk to the food industry. Yeah. But the second I take a single solitary penny from that those companies, I become an extension of those companies. Because mm. you can't take money from someone and then criticize them. It doesn't, 
it doesn't work. You can't go, well, I'm going to take a load of money from a big company and then say they're bad. People are like, well, you, we took their money mm. and you sign a contract. Whenever you take their money, yeah. you sign a contract saying, I won't criticize the company. That's the bigger thing. Oh. So the, there is a real problem in the UK. There are very few media doctors, people like you, or, or, all our UK equivalents to you have, maybe not all, but most of them have relationships with companies that make ultra processed food. Yeah. They have podcasts that are sponsored, they're investors, they front brands, they produce products, mm. you know, and that they are the, they are the biggest problem for me because, because they are so respectable and people look to doctors more than, you know, rightly or wrongly, more than almost any other profession is, you know, we've signed an oath saying we will tell the truth, we'll look after our patients. Mm -hmm. And so the doctors who can be bought are, they are the most, most troubling people. The people in the food industry, well, they're just selling food. That's what they got to do. Yeah. Luckily, there's a lot of people now engaging in this, like you and Marit Kolbe and myself. I'm trying as my best to change the way that, and you're the not diet. about to sign a sponsorship deal with Coca-Cola No, McDonald's I and... will never, <laughs> never, ever. So uh, as long as we're conscious about this, we will make changes and it will change um, year by year. My ask, my the work of my kind of academic lifetime will be to see an octagon on a can of cola in the UK. If, yeah. I, if I can, if when I die, there are black octagons on cola, yeah. I will die a happy person. That 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 is what we have to do, and it's it's clear, it's evidence based, it creates great clarity. It's not an infringement of people's liberties. It doesn't restrict choice. Mm -hmm. It just gives people information and a warning about stuff we know is harmful. I hope you get to live and see that, and I hope <laughs> it will happen next year. I really appreciate that. Okay, well, let's take three questions before okay. we go. Um, hmm, what should I ask you? Mm, I got so many questions What's the hard ones? I like the, you know, because people may be hearing the counter arguments in the media from scientists who are funded by the food industry, you know. You've asked some of these already. Anyway, yeah, so you, yeah, you asked yeah. the questions, you asked the questions. Uh, well, one question that I got a lot that would be great if you could answer is, is all ultra processed foods equal? Is it equally as harmful to eat the whole grain bread as to eat the cookie? Um, I don't think that focusing on individual foods as being good or bad is ever helpful. Broccoli is not a healthy food. If you try and live on broccoli, you will die quite soon. You can live much longer on burgers. So, but broccoli in the context of a diet with lots of other stuff that's a bit like broccoli is a really healthy thing to eat. Whereas mm. a diet based around burgers is generally less healthy. Mm. So um, pointing at ultra, pro so let's compare whole grain ultra processed bread with uh, like, I don't know, uh, you know, one of those uh, bars that has no ingredients that you would ever use in a kitchen that all it's all synthetic, weird, yeah, yeah, yeah. modified starches and things. Now, the, or, or, a, or a chocolate bar, you know, now the, the chocolate bar, if you were to eat the same number of calories, the chocolate bar probably would be more harmful. I think we could, we could guess that and it wouldn't contain any whole grains. The problem is that the chocolate bar, we all kind of know that. So we don't actually eat that many chocolate bars. The risk with the bread is it's the foundation of our diet and we eat it for breakfast and lunch mm -hmm. and dinner. Yeah. And so I, I think it's, it's complicated. Mm. The, the, the evidence is all about the category of food. And I think whenever you try and like, give me an, an example of an ultra processed food and I'll tell you the reasons it may be harmful. The food without calories, we've discussed how it may harm you. The, the breads contain the emulsifiers, the flavorings, they're soft, they drive, they're energy dense, they drive excess consumption. The mm. chocolate bar I will have emulsifiers. It will have high sugar and fat content. Like it's very hard to point at any one food and go, but this would be okay. Because it's all made in a system that is about making you buy the next thing as quickly as possible. That's the purpose of the food. So I, mm. I can't think of ultra processed food that I would call healthy compared to its non ultra processed equivalent. But what what if it only has one ingredient that is uh, like well, one? Well, that's a great example. So so uh, it, it, like so so well, a chocolate bar might well just have an emulsifier, you know, or. Um, uh, 
uh, say a ready meal, you know, a microwavable lasagna or something, it might just have one little bit of dextrose or some maltodextrin or yeah. one thing. Yeah. The issue is not the additives in that case. The issue is that that lasagna has been tested on hundreds, thousands of people until it is absolutely perfect and you cannot stop eating it. Hmm. So when you buy it, you know, you get, if you ever, you've eat, I mean, I used to live on microwave lasagnas and you never leave a bit. You never like leave some in the pack. You're like digging it out, <laughs> licking the, you know, or, or a pack of chips might just have a bit of flavoring. It's mainly potatoes and oil, but yeah. you like you open the pack up and lick it, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The food is all, the additives are a proxy for food that is produced in a system that is only about making money. That The additives are not the main show, but sure, they, some of them are harmful. They are just a sign that this is food made in a system that is about making you eat more and buy more. Hmm. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I got a question from one listener that I, I thought that was a great question. She says, um, I think I'm addicted to ultra processed foods. Do I need to quit Uh, it all together, or can I eat 10 to 20% ultra processed? So I try and not give any advice. I'm not, I, I'm an, I guess I'm an academic nutritional expert. I'm not a clinical food addiction expert. I don't, I don't treat patients like that. So I'm, I'm not going to give advice. My lived experience and my general understanding is that addicts find moderation very hard. Mm. If this person is addicted to a particular product, you know, it's the, you know, this particular cookie, yeah. then maybe they can just be abstinent from that cookie. But most of the time we're generally addicted to a few different things for me. You know, I, there are a few things I really like was nuts about. So I, I think generally the addiction is, is, is quite category wide and you may find being abstinent from the whole thing simple. Hmm. The thing about abstinence is it, it creates great cognitive clarity. You don't have to have an argument with yourself. You don't have to discuss it. You just have, it's binary and it's easy. Yeah. Um, so that that's my experience. But I think if this person is asking the question, they are 95% of the way to solving the problem. Because if you start, first stage of all addiction treatment is recognizing the problem. If you have insight, you are you know, so far down the line toward, toward getting help, yeah. getting treatment. But, and addictions are all complex. You know, I, I, I lived with an addiction to UPF, but it, it was never driving ill health. My brother in the States, in different circumstances, you know, was really eating to excess. So sometimes we can manage our life and then we need to sort our life out and then the addiction will clear. We'll stop smoking or drinking. Or But what did you do? Because you did a 30-day trial and you, you could see on your MRI scans... That. Yeah. So, but what my, my, my MRI scans are very hard to interpret. We, we haven't scanned loads of people eating a UPF diet. We don't, we don't really know what would happen to children. Um, they resonate with an idea of addiction, but I had this very weird experience of midway through the diet, talking to colleagues in Brazil, I stopped wanting the food. They like flick this switch. So a lot of people find with addiction that you can suddenly switch. How, we, how did they, they switch that? So um, the, this, this, and I, I will, do, I, I said this to Wolfgang as well, but I'm happy to repeat this because if, if I can do this on your podcast to someone who can't afford the book, it's going to annoy my publicist Yarl there, but I, I would rather someone was helped than bought the book. Um, they said to me, they kept, it was a scientist called Fernanda and she kept saying to me, it is not food. Food is about nourishment, love, community, that's why you make it. This food is about profit. It is an industrially produced edible substance. It's not food. And we were talking about how it's made. So it's, it's made from, like when I say it's made from rice, wheat, corn, soy, it's not made from those whole ingredients. If you're a corn farmer, right, you grow corn, you harvest it, and then you turn it into modified corn starch, high fructose corn syrup, corn oil, and corn protein isolate. The soy, similarly, soy protein isolate, soy oil, soy starch. You break these crops down into their molecular components. These pastes and powders have infinite shelf life nearly. You ship them around the world and you reassemble them into dinosaur shapes or chew bars or breakfast cereals or breads or whatever. So it's not food. It's like you've, you've taken a plant, but you've destroyed it, extracted some molecules, and now you've reassembled this thing that you can eat 
and it is calorific and it will sustain life in the barest possible sense, mm. but it will not do anything else. And, and as she said this, it was, I didn't engage with it. It was when I sat down that evening to eat, it was a meal of KFC. In the book, it is not KFC for narrative reasons. I'd already mentioned KFC, so I talk about a different product, but it was KFC. And I just, it was just disgusting. I was like, and the food tasted the same, but the, the switch that was flicked is I no longer uh, liked the food and I didn't want it anymore. So I was eating it, it tasted the same, but I, I just could sort of imagine you know, once you know about the companies that make your food, they're not, these, these like lots of our food is just made by giant conglomerates owned by pension funds. These aren't like food companies. They, they're companies that do commodity training, uh, trading, some of them own technology firms. I mean, they just do a whole bunch of stuff. They're just like massive trans-global corporations. Mm. So they're not food companies. But, but you could see on your MRI scans that something changed? So, well, no, you couldn't see that. So the weird thing was the, I became unaddicted but we we you couldn't see that switch flicked on the scans probably because we weren't looking hard enough in the right place i'm only one person and, and because no one understands that neurology so we know it happens and lots of people listening will have had this in a human relationship where you can be intensely attracted to someone and then suddenly very quickly be like oh you know love and disgust are quite closely linked and especially food we can Food we can very quickly be disgusted by. So if I, there's some great disgust experiments where you can do, where if you take a glass, this is, I mean, this is going to disgust everyone. You can take a glass and you can spit into the glass every five minutes for an hour. And at the end, you'll have a little cup like this full of saliva. Now drink the saliva. You can't do it. It's absolutely, you can't even look at it. You can't even think about it. <laughs> But you were going to drink all that saliva anyway. It was in your mouth. Yeah. So, f so dis we're always on the edge. You know, if I take this food and I, if I were to just put it on the floor for five seconds and then put it on the table, it's suddenly disgusting. You don't want to, you don't want to eat it. So something switched. Yeah. Inside. So food is always is always we can always be disgusted by our food. It's it's if you see a fly land on it. So I'm trying to. I guess I mean I'll wear this. I'm trying to slightly manipulate. The reader, I mean, I, I'm open about this, into feeling disgusted by this stuff that isn't food. That's that's that was. I felt like that was a gift given to me, and it's what I want to give to the reader. What the did book. you say, Felicia? Said, uh, Fernanda said, Fernanda. Um, "This is not food. It is an industrially produced edible substance." Industrial produced edible substance. Yeah, it's mm. not food. It's not food. And if you read, so anyone listening to this, like people are listening, they'll have a pack of whatever. Get your pack and read the ingredients. And you'll see things like, some of it like palm oil. Like, why is palm oil in your biscuit? So palm oil is a traditional oil. It's used in West African cooking. It's delicious. It's spicy. It's bright red. That's not the palm oil in your Nutella or your biscuits. That The palm oil in your biscuits has been put through this refined, bleached, deodorized, interesterified, and then hydrogenated. It's this RBD process. And it's turned palm oil into an ice white hard butter-like substance that contains no nutrition. It's just raw calories. Hmm. So even when you read things that feel like food that you might buy, do you notice, you ever noticed mango kernel fat? No. So if you eat a mango, you know, you eat a mango and you're left with a, a nut in the middle. Yeah. If you crack that husk, yeah. there's a, there's a giant cashew nut in the middle of it. It looks like a cashew. Really? Yeah. Now you can't eat that. It's very, bitter and disgusting. It's not good fat. But you can take that waste, you can put it through this RBD process and you can turn it into an edible fat. You can take any plant or vegetable, extract the fat from it, put it through an edible oil refinery and end up with fat that is non-toxic. Huh. So co cottonseed oil. Hmm. Cottonseed oil is quite poisonous, very disgusting. The, the, in the 19th century, uh, the, the, a massive step in food processing was to turn, was to detoxify the cottonseed oil and create Crisco, the, you know, in the first margarines. And yeah. you'll see cottonseed oil still available in the States. It's, naturally, it's a poisonous oil. You have to detoxify it. So, so is it, is it, po my point is not to go palm fat is poisonous. My point is just to go, you're not eating a thing that is real food. You're eating something that's been massively chemically modified mm. and transformed. So it, it came from a palm tree, but it is nothing like mm. um, palm fat. What, did you, what do you do yourself? Do you eat any uh, ultra-processed foods? I eat it to be polite. 
So if I'm at a friend's house and they've got crisps out, I'll I'll eat them because I don't want to be a weirdo. I don't want. Th- and if you refuse to eat this stuff, people think you are judging them. You know. Yeah. It's very bad. It's very. And that's sad because it's very the- rude to refuse food. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um. I went out last night with some after the talk. Yeah. Did I you took, go I, out with Turkil in there? No. Oh. Well, no. Yeah. Well, I went out with my mother-in-law to get a bite to eat, but we walked into a bar and there were there was everyone. So we hadn't eaten anything. It was 10 o'clock at night. Yeah. So I ordered a little tray of cheese and ham and there was some bread with it. Now, was the bread UPF? I, I didn't ask. I like ate the bread. I was hungry. So, yeah. you know, so yeah, I, I'll eat it. But I generally I am abstinent. Mm. Hmm. Okay. 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 Last question. I always ask yeah, my guests this. If you had to leave the planet today, Uh, and you could tell. I have to leave the planet. Yes, you had to leave the planet today, but you could give give three advices to everyone on this planet. What would it be? When you say leave the planet, I'm gonna you're gonna kill yeah, me. I'm gonna be die, dead. I'm gonna die, be dead. Okay. Or you had to move to Mars. Oh, I don't want to give any advice. I, I refuse to give advice. I will not give advice. Um, I would ask. I would ask people to to ask some questions though, and maybe maybe I would. I would say that we do need policy change. So I think what I would say is I would want to change the structure of the environment. So my three policy changes, and I guess maybe this is a form of advice, is it should be as unacceptable to take money from a big food company as it, as it is to take money from a tobacco company. It perhaps should be forbidden if you are a charity or a, or a government policymaker. That's one The next thing is we should have warning labels on unhealthy food. I don't really care how we define the unhealthy food. You just should have warning labels on unhealthy food. We all basically agree on unhealthy food. You know, it doesn't matter. You call it ultra processed, high fat, salt, sugar, industrially processed. It's there's great agreement. Mm. Um, and I guess my final thought is if I if I'm if I'm killed today, there are a, a lot of people who are really struggling with their food, and many of them are kids, and mm. those people are are shamed. And and they and they they suffer terribly. And I think on on my travels around the world as a physician, I, I've just seen kids really really suffering. And we see it in the UK. And mm. I, I would just say to those people, no matter what you think about your willpower, you you you, you know this is not your fault. This food is engineered by geniuses to drive you to eat more and more of it. And so it is not your fault. It is the food, and we must change the food environment. Thank you for saying that. Where can my uh, audience find you? Oh, on on Instagram, I guess doc, at Dr. Chris VT on Twitter. But I, you know, I'm not there all that often. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess those those are my two. I'm not on TikTok or Snapchat. That would that would be. I didn't even know. <laughs> yeah. And the book is out in Norwegian. The now. book is out in Norwegian. Buy It's it in Norwegian. Enjoy buy it in Norwegian. In Norwegian. Ultra processed. Uh, oh, what was it in Norwegian? Ultra processed. Hvorfor spiser vi greier som ikke er mat, og hvorfor klarer vi ikke å stoppe? Ultra processed. Hører de det? Ja, ja, ja. De hører den, ja. So buy it. I highly recommend it. I've read it in English. You can read it in English in Norwegian. And if you have any questions for me, please send me a message on Instagram or Facebook. I can't, I read them all, but I can't answer everything. But if there's something you want to say to Chris, uh, say it in the comment, uh, comment in the Instagram because there I read everything and uh, respond. And if you and think- And I will try and respond as well. I, I try and avoid Instagram, but I have to engage with Instagram because it's not, it's, Instagram is nice and people go there for good information. So I got, I got to try and be there. Yeah. And if you think this, this talk is important, send it to your loved ones because I think that if more people get this information and this knowledge, the change will happen sooner. So thank you so much for listening. Oh and thank, thank you, you, Chris, for being here. I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful for Wolfgang uh, uh, barring uh, us the studio. Thank you. I was impressed that we didn't repeat too much. It was, I think it was quite a different talk. It was lovely. Really? Yeah. I was worried oh. we were just going to do it all again, but no, it was very different. <laughs> oh, that's good. So you can listen to Chris on the Wolfgang's uh, podcast as well. Okay, thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>